Church, I love the Valentines, everybody. Love them, love them. Hey, how's the greatest church on the planet doing today? You guys ready for the word? Say a big welcome home to those that are joining us online and all of our first and second timers. We are thrilled you guys are with us. You know, I, I listen to stories like that with with um, uh, the Valentines, and I think, man, 10 years, where has the time gone? And, and what's exciting is watching our, our families grow, not just older, but expand. And, and whether you're marrying, you know, or you have new children and, and kids are having, we're having babies left and right, you know, whatever that looks like. It's just really fun to do life together. I truly believe that that's what God had in mind when he thought about the family of God and his people and, and a, a church in the community that is Bible-believing, loves each other, loves Jesus, and loves doing life together. And, uh, and so I, I'm excited that you guys are here. We are really, really excited about this season that God has us in. I am, first of all, very grateful that you are safe and secure. Uh, we, were, we were, you know, watching the, the news like all of you this past uh, a few days with, with the hurricane. And what we're going to be doing <clears throat> is we're going to reach out to the, the church planting network that we're a part of to ask, all right, where is the greatest need? Because I, I know that many times we'll say, hey, um, let's go do something. And it's almost like a ready, fire, aim. And I love that passion. And, but, but what we want to do is make sure that we are strategic and intentional so we have a plan and we work the plan. So we're very grateful to be in, in relational connection with those that are in that area. So we want you to know that a part of your ministry dollars, your missions dollars, your national ministry dollars will go to help churches and believers in communities that have been affected. I know there's so many, there's so, so many uh, communities that were affected and it can be a little bit overwhelming when you, we were driving back from out of town yesterday and we saw nothing but down trees coming up north from, from Florida and and you think, well, what, what, what can we do? What can we do? Because we're, we're not, I mean, we don't, we, we don't have a checkbook with a, just an opening a checkbook. What can we do with our energy? What can we do with our prayers? Hey, what we can do makes an eternal difference. How about that? What we can do matters to the people that we're able to partner with. So be encouraged and also be in prayer. Be in prayer to, for those that, are, uh, that have been affected. I, I was honestly thinking, you know, Florida and the West Coast and the surge areas, but man, I tell you, um, Asheville and, and some of those communities have really, really been, been harmed. So can we just pray for them today as well? Um, hey, um, we've got first Wednesday coming up this, this coming Wednesday. And the reason, reason I'm, I'm putting that out there for you is this, is at the end of October, we have an expert in eschatology, someone who's an expert in end time teaching. How many of y'all like a little end time teaching every now and then? Yeah, it's really interesting, really fun. Uh, it's not scary because the Bible says, encourage one another with these things. So if you see someone that's trying to intimidate you or scare you into that, just know that's not biblical. I'm encouraged as a follower of Christ when Jesus is coming back. I'm not afraid, <laughs> all right? So we've got someone, Reverend Joseph Morris will be with us the end of October, the last Sunday of October, I'll be here. He's gonna be here. We've got a special Sunday, especially for that, for, for that, for that idea of end time teachings. What's coming? What does that look like? What does the Bible say? Not what do we think? No, what does the Bible say? Now, we've had Reverend Joe Morris with us for two other times uh, in the last decade or so. And he travels the world, sought after. But here's what I know. He goes really fast. And, um, and I'm kind of at the, the grade level of like a middle school boy, okay? And, and, and it's almost like, hey, good luck at, at a college level course. Not because it's difficult, but mainly because it's just faster pace. So what I'm going to do is I want to prepare you. I want to give you the cheat codes <laughs> for, for Reverend Morris. If you'll come this Wednesday at seven o'clock at first Wednesday, I'm going to be teaching on end times, end time teaching, end time. What does the Bible say about that? What are the chronological things? What, what do I need to know? What do I need to do to prepare? How can I pray? What are signs? That, how many know there's signs that are happening right now in our lifetime that are pointing that he is coming back. He is coming back soon. Well, my, my grandparents said that and they never happened. Well, then how much closer are we to his return? Amen. <laughs> So that, that's, I'm really excited about that. So this, sun, this, this Wednesday, I'm gonna be preparing you for the end of October when Reverend Morris is with us. Um, I, again, if, if, if you um, 
If you're new to Highlands, we do first Wednesday, every single Wednesday. It's more of a believer service, a little bit faster pace. But this Wednesday, I'm gonna slow it down because I want you to be prepared so you can enjoy all that, that the Word is gonna be teach, uh, taught to you at the end of October, okay? Here, let me introduce you to some really good friends of mine, some folks that have been with us for years. Um, I'm not gonna bring them on the stage, but I want you to find them in the lobby uh, between services. Uh, how many know that we have some wonderful trustees here at our church? Can we put our hands together for the guys that serve us so well? They're so, so, so blessed to have them in helping us to navigate the expansion, really having us to navigate, helping us to, to navigate just doing ministry and where, where can we put our energy? Where can I put our resources? Where can we have the biggest impact for God in this time that we're living? And so if you have not met our trustees, what we want to do is, is uh, throughout the month, we want to start just having them put them out in the lobby and say, hey, listen, Put a name with a face, and they'd love to meet you. They'd love to get to know you and, uh, and, and shake your hand if you have not met them. There, some of them are going to be out in the lobby today. Would love to connect with you. They're going to be over by that big, massive wall that's unpainted. That bothers me every Sunday. Does that bother you guys? <laughs> but it's a temporary wall. That's why we haven't painted it. There's no sense in painting it. It's just coming down. But they're going to be hanging out there, and they, would, they really would love to meet you. You know why? Because we as a team... We pray for you, and we, they, would like to put a name on the face. Hey, when I'm praying, God, how, how do we navigate this time that we're living in? How do we invest wisely? How do we, get, how do we fulfill the vision that God has for our church? And the vision isn't just a number, it's a name. They would like to meet your name, meet, meet, put a name on the face, okay? So they're going to be out there between services. All right, are y'all ready for the word today? Are, come on, are y'all ready for the word today? Come on, I'm, I'm a little tan. I preach better when I'm tan, somebody. <laughs> you know, we, we've talked about this for, for weeks now. We're studying some of the Old Testament kings of, of Israel and Judah. And, and um, we, we know that some kings get more playtime on Sundays with different churches. And maybe even this one. How about that? We know about, about King Saul. We know about King David. We know about Solomon. But what I've, I've really enjoyed teaching about the kings that you may not have ever heard of if you haven't read about them. Kings that really don't get much playtime. We talked about who, who last week? The, the Boams, the Boam brothers. They weren't brothers, but the Boams, Jeroboam and, and Jeroboam. Today, today I'm talking about one of those guys that does not get much playing time, but I'm telling you, he did an amazing, amazing work for God while he was in leadership, but he made a big mistake that I see that is, is really overshadowing our culture today. And I wanna make sure that we can see it coming so we can keep it out of our life, okay? Are you ready to pray today? Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this time in your word. And God, I pray right now, we just take this time, not rushing, but Lord, for every person that was impacted, that was affected by the hurricane, the storms and God, I, I pray that, that you would use your hand, would go across the waters, that would go across our nation. And Lord, where, where we are so divided right now in the world, God, I pray a spirit of unity that we've come alongside and, and, and not criticize, but help one another, serve one another, put someone else's needs before our own. God, may we, the church, model that really well. God, I pray for, for the, the, the churches in the area that they're not, they're not meeting today. Simply, they, they cannot. But Lord, I pray that you would, and, and I don't know how, but Holy Spirit, bring them closer together. May you be lifted up. Maybe, may you be lifted up in the time of crisis in our nation. Lord, I pray for those pastors that are downhearted. They had momentum and they were seeing fruit and they were seeing life change. And, and it's like, what, what do we do? God, sit with that brother right now. Sit with that family right now and say, you're still on the throne, God. You're still on the throne. God, I know, because I know history, that you do your greatest work in times of crisis. And then we know that we're not gonna walk in fear right now because you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. God, I pray that you would challenge us today with your word. Challenge us today with your word. 
May a spirit of generosity come on our church as we live for you and glorify you in everything that we think, we say, and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. This is what we're going to do. We're going to skip down chronologically today. I'm not going to go chronological order, but we're going to skip down a little bit to the 10th king of Judah. The 10th, the tenth king of Judah. Next to King Solomon, this king um, we'll be discussing today probably has, has the most success in, 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 in his reign as king in their nation's history. The leader took his seat on the throne at the age of 16. Come on, how, how many 16-year-old like leaders do you know right now? Let me, let me look at my, my teenagers. You can lead at 16, amen? And it gets even, even younger than that in, in the different kings. But this, this one took the, took the helm at age 16. And his official name is, is Uzziah, um, Uzziah. But also, you're going to read here, and I'm, let me clear some things up. Second Chronicles uses the name Uzziah, where Second Kings refers, him, refers to him as Azariah. Same guy. Okay, don't, don't get weird about it. Don't, don't, don't get lost. Same guy. Um, his official name as king is Azariah was a given name, or Azariah was a given name. We're going to refer to him as Uzziah today. We're going to be reading from the story from the book of Second Chronicles. So if you go ahead and turn there or turn to the table of contents, we're going to have some good times today because this is, I'm going to preach with a smile on my face because this is one of those heavy, hard, every, no one's leaving unscathed today, including the guy with the microphone. I was reading and studying and I thought, this is amazing. Oh my gosh, this is awful. Oh my, this is me in this story in, in times of my life. And so God's going to speak to you today. When he challenges you and he convicts you, it's not condemnation. God does not put condemnation and guilt and shame on you. He does, however, by His Spirit, convict us and show us there's a little bit of that going on in me. And, and we're going to address that today uh, while in our time together, okay? The Bible says, Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king and reigned in Jerusalem. 52 years, his mother, Jecolite, was, was uh, from Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. Now watch this just as his fathers did, just as his father did. Don't, don't, don't miss this. There is, I, please don't miss this. Dads, your role is important. Your, 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 your wake of righteousness will affect those behind you. And he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just like his dad did, all right? And, and Uzziah sought God during the days of Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, there's, there's, I think there's 34 Zechariahs in the, in the Bible. This isn't the, the big name, the, the, the prophet. This was just a godly mentor in his life, okay? He, 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 he sought God during the days of Zechariah, who taught him to fear God. And as long as the king sought guidance from the Lord, God gave him what? God gave him what? As long as he sought guidance from the Lord, that, that God gave him success. Now, let's, let's pay really close attention to what this scripture says. This is the way of success according to the Bible is this. You, you seek to know the Lord. It says that Uzziah sought God. I want to know you. I don't want to know about you. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I, I, here's another way of success is I need some godly mentors in my life. I, I, I don't know it all. We, we learned from weeks gone by that it, these guys, that they sought godly mentors. They sought, now it's one thing of seeking and listening. It's another thing of doing what they suggested, right? But he sought, he sought godly. He had a godly mentor. He, 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 was, he, stay, he was staying teachable. So it's one thing to get advice, mentorship, godly counsel. And then he said, you know what? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remain teachable. I don't know it all, and I'm going to walk in that, all right? How about this? Ha have a healthy fear, not phobia, but a healthy fear, honor, and respect of the Lord. We've talked about that today. Why? Because where the fear of the Lord is, that's the beginning of wisdom. And so he had a healthy fear of God, not a phobia of God, but a fear of the Lord and seek guidance from the Lord. These some, there's some big decisions that he had to make as a leader of a nation that he knew, God, I, me on my best day, I don't know enough. I need you to tell me your yes. Can we, let me tell you this right now. God's will is for you to live in success and to walk in success and to experience success. Not that you're gonna have, never gonna have setbacks, not that you're gonna stump your toe every now and then, not that you're gonna fall. Hey, listen, the righteous fall seven times, but they get back up. 
So here's, here's what I'm saying. God wants you to succeed. God wants to help you. God wants to bless your life. But, but we need to it, look to him to seek for, all right, in this decision, what do I do? All right? Uzziah was famous for his success. God gave Uzziah wisdom to construct these amazing inventions that were so far beyond his time, towers and wells that served as cisterns in the desert that enabled their livestock and their, their, their farms and their vineyards to flourish even in the desert. It was, it was amazing. How about this? Engines of war were mounted in strategic places, towers and corners of cities of walls. These inventions gave his army, it's really amazing, the ability to shoot multiple arrows at, 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 one, at one time. And, and, and also contraptions, and you've seen, you've seen Braveheart. Come on, well, uh, all the old people have anyway. So when they had the big, the big thing that slung the big boulders and stuff, he was doing that back in the day. He, God gave him this wisdom to, to invent in things that prospered their, prospered their nation. Now let's keep reading. Uzziah built fortified towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate. And at the angle in the wall, he also constructed forts in the wilderness and dug many water cisterns because he kept great herds of livestock in the foothills of Judah and on the plains. He was also a man who loved the soil. He had many workers who cared for his farms and vineyards, both on the hillsides and in the fertile valleys. What's he saying? He said, this guy was so smart, he prospered in the, in the sand and he prospered in the dirt. I mean, the dude just had it going on. Uzziah had an army of well-trained warriors ready to march into battle. Unit by unit, these regiments of mighty warriors were commanded by, this is, this is how many leaders they had, 2,600 leaders. The army consisted of 307, uh, 307,000 men, 500 men, and elite, all elite troops. They were prepared to assist the king against any enemy. Goes on to say, Uzziah provided the entire army with shields, helmets, spears, coats, uh, coats of mail, bows, and sling stones. And he built structures. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier. He built structures on the wall to protect those who shot arrows and hurled large stones in from towers and corners of the wall. His fame, his fame spread far and wide. The Lord gave, I love this, gave him marvelous help. Everybody say help. God didn't do it for him because God, God can't help somebody who doesn't help themselves. Like God can't, look, it's easy to move a, to, 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 to steer a moving car. It, he, he asked for God's guidance. He, he put his faith in action and God helped him. He gave him marvelous help, but, and he became very powerful, very successful. Now, what this, this amazing life of a leader shows us that, man, he, he was seeking to know the Lord. He received godly counsel. He stayed teachable. He, he, he had a fear of the Lord. He understood where he was in the pecking order. He was not God. He was king, but he was not God. And he also always sought the Lord with guidance. Guys, I've got, I've got big decisions. I don't know what to do. And as a young man, he just started so well. God, I'm a kid. I don't know what I'm doing, but I know that you do. And I know that you want to help me. And he succeeded and he became powerful and, and had influence in his country. But all of a sudden, later in the chapter, Uzziah's life takes a turn. He started so well. And all of a sudden, it went down the wrong path. It says, but when he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. Let's read that again. When he became powerful, he also became Proud. Everybody say pride. Everybody say pride. pride. Say pride like you know somebody's got it. Pride. But not yours. Because you're proud. Mm -hmm. uh, let that sink in. It, the Lord gave him great success. But write this down. Success mismanaged leads to destruction. I don't know if you know this, but God will test you with success. <laughs> Lord, test me. Test me, God. Oh, okay, be careful with that prayer because would you, would you pass the test if God gave you what you've been praying for? If God gave you that promotion, if God gave you that influence, if God gave you that voice, if God gave you that wisdom to solve that problem, which would, which would catapult you to a, a level of, of great success, would, would you self-destruct? 
Would you become proud and haughty and walk away from the God that you sought for guidance? Would your fame and success and influence cause you to grow closer to God and your need for Him and His Spirit's working in your life? Or would it cause you to go, I'm good now, I got this. Pride is the oldest sin in the universe. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote. He said, pride is the mother hen in which all other sins are hatched. Wow, it's powerful. Pride is what took Lucifer out of heaven. Satan, Satan said, I will ascend. I, I will ascend to the throne of God. I, I, be careful when you see the word I coming out of your mouth a lot. All right? Pride, pride that changed, it was, it was pride that changed angels to demons. It was pride that took King Saul out of the kingdom and out of his seat. It was pride today that turns friends into enemies. Today, listen, pride is, is rampant in the culture because we see ourselves over or better than others, and that is not the case. This is what God, well, what does God think about pride? I'm glad you asked. Here we go. It doesn't get any more clear than this. Pride and arrogance. I, God, hate. hate hate's a strong word. Like, God hates it. How about this? Proverbs 16, 5. Everyone who is arrogant in heart has an abomination, is an abomination to the Lord. And be assured, he will not go unpunished. How many of y'all believe the Bible is true? He says, hey, don't be mistaken. He will not go unpunished. Why? Because God hates pride. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction in a haughty spirit before a fall. How do we beat pride? Well, humility is the only remedy for pride. The Bible says in James 4, 6, 4, 6, God opposes. That's a military term. Like, I'm gonna clothesline you. I, I'm going to stand against you. God opposes the proud, but he gives what? Grace to, to the humble. If you don't humble, you will stumble. Ooh, that's good preaching right there. It's the truth. If, we, if you don't humble, if we don't humble ourselves, we will stumble our way through life. I don't know about you. I don't need God opposing me. God's never lost a fight. He's not gonna start with me. I don't need his opposition. I need his hand of favor. How about you, right? I need God's grace so much. I, I just, God, I can't live without it. I can't live without it. Pride is a lose, lose situation. Before we look back at King Uzziah's life and what, what caused him to do this, what happened when he did this, before we do that, um, we're going to take a, a fun pride test. Now, we're not going to say yes out loud. These are rhetorical questions. You don't raise your hand, okay, if you do. But if you do, I guess you don't have pride because you re realize that you're a wreck. But anyway, we're going to take this test together. Are you ready? Okay, the pride test. Let's keep score. Eight questions. Here we go. Do you need a lot of attention? It's going to be real quiet right now. All right? How about this? Do you become jealous or critical of people who succeed? Well, you know, I know how they're getting ahead in life. I, I, I can't believe that. Well, I just, I, I, they don't deserve that. I don't, you can't celebrate them, okay? Do you always have to win? Now, oh, I heard a woo. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Now, listen, I don't like this one. Because I beat my kids like a mule at Uno. I make them earn their win. Come on, right? Let them win. No, you got to beat me. I got to watch. This is, this is one of my, mm -hmm. how about this? Do you have a pattern of lying? No way, men's okay. All right. All right, so what am I, what, why would I say that? Well, maybe you feel the need to lie often because God forbid you learn... Someone learned something about you that, that it wouldn't be good for your image, right? See how prideful lying can be? We, we lie to make ourselves look better, and we lie to make other people look worse. Why? So we can look superior in our comparison of them. Do you find yourself lying over dumb things, little things? Why? Just to make yourself look better. How about this? Do, do you have a hard time confessing you are wrong? Here's a better indicator. When is the last time you confessed something instead of having to be caught at something? See, let's pray and go home. Can we just pray and go home? When is the last time you just, you, did, you didn't need a threat. You didn't need a, oh, I'm gonna get caught. This is just, a, hey, I said something. Hey, I did. Oh, you know, I blew it right there. When is the last, can you think of it? If you can't, 
This message is for your neighbor. How about this? Do you consistently have conflicts with other people? You, you might, you might want to write this down. Most times humility will bring unity. All right, not all times, but the majority of time, humility. I've never te- seen two humble people just constantly at all. Have you? Like, oh, they're so humble, I hate them. Like, no one does that, right? If you live in a steady state of conflict, guess what? There's pride in your life. I mean, I, it doesn't work all the time because every time, unless you, unless the other party is a lunatic or a raging narcissist. But have you given humility a chance? Right? Do you consist? I'm not saying con, you can't avoid conflict, but I'm talking about just a steady state. I just kind of steadily. There's some conflict somewhere in your life, brother, my friend, sister. You have pride in your heart. How about this? Do you feel that rules apply to others? <laughs> no, I would never do that. Okay, well, we'll ride behind you in your car today, right? Are you more important than other cars on the road? You know, oh, I, I, I get a pass. You know, I, 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 I got to be somewhere. Like, they don't have to be somewhere. Like, yeah, but, I, you know, I, what you're saying is, do you know who I am? Yeah, the guy that's about to get a ticket. Okay, how about this last one? That's all right. That's okay. We'll figure that out. It happened last week, so there's something going on in the uh, in the system. That's all right. Um, do you do you often have? an enti- attitude of entitlement. Stay with me. An entitlement attitude. Like, do you feel like the world owes you something? Uh, let me speak. Let me just speak to the young people. How about the, how about the students? Do, do you think that your parents owe you a vehicle because you're God's gift to the world? Parents, I need some help right now. It's really quiet in this church. Okay. Do you think that your teacher at school owes you a better grade because you've graced their class with your presence? Or you tried hard. I tried hard. You owe me. Congratulations for trying hard. Okay, let me pick on the college students. I'm an equal opportunity offender right now. Okay, college students, do you feel like the world owes you a job just because you have a degree? <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. Do you feel like you you should be in a C-suite executive role because you've really worked hard for two whole years? Okay. Now look, look. By, by the way, I want I want everyone to add up your score because here we go. Here's the here, here's the scoring system we have. If you scored one through eight, you are a proud person. If you scored zero, then you're a very proud person. <laughs> And don't feel humiliated or ashamed because I scored 12 when there were only eight options. Okay? We can all agree that success is great. But let's look at Uzziah's life, how he mismanaged success, and it cost him everything. Okay? Uzziah sinned against the Lord his God, by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple one day and personally burning incense on on the incense altar. Sounds familiar? Does anybody remember Saul? Okay. This this act, this this serve, this was reserved for only the priests. You can't do that. You're the king. You're not a priest. Know your role. We thank God for you, but you're not a priest. And this, this is reserved for this, for the people of God. This is a service role. Ah, come on, man. How hard could it be? Burn a little incense. Come on. Then he says, Azariah, the high priest, went in after him with 80 other priests of the Lord, all these brave men. They confronted King Uzziah and said, King, it is not for you to burn incense to the Lord. Th- that is the work of the priests alone the descendants of Aaron who are set apart for this work. King, get out of the sanctuary. You have sinned. The Lord God will not honor you for this. But watch watch his response. Was he still teachable? No. He says, Uzziah, who was holding the incense burner, became furious. 
Who do you think you are? Don't you know who I am? Write this down. There's two indicators about pride. Well, number one is pride believes holy things can be treated lightly and with disrespect. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. It is a big deal. Why? Because it's a holy thing. Okay? Your time in God's word, spinning, reading, that's a holy thing. Oh, it's, it's no big deal. I can, I, no, it's a holy thing. Take that. When you're, in, when you're in prayer, it's a holy thing. When you're in worship, do you know the people that have the hardest time worshiping are prideful people? I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching. I'm seeing what the lights are doing. I'm watching what the team's doing. That sounded good. I, I, I give it a pass as if we're like American Idol. Good, go see it in Hollywood, right? Oh, it's good. It's good. Well, I just didn't really get anything out of that. Someone told me that years ago. I think I told you that. I just really didn't get anything out of worship today. I said, good. We weren't worshiping you. (laughs) Where do you get off? Right? How about this? Pride becomes angry when confronted by godly voices. Godly voices. I, I miss the old days. The old days a godly voice could correct someone that they love in a godly way, in a life-giving way, and they could receive that and go, man, thank you. I, thank you. I want to get better. I don't, I don't want to grieve the Spirit of God, and I definitely don't want to distract others from knowing God. Today, people are one breath away from being offended and walking out. On friendships, let alone churches, but friendships, God, these are the same people that pray and fast and love people and, and they, they, they have a moment of, hey, let me encourage you with this. There's something that, that I want to challenge you with, okay? And, and, and I love you. I'm here for you. I can't believe what, that they loved you enough to tell you the truth. I miss the old days, okay? Let's keep reading. But as he was standing there raging against the priest before the incense altar of the Lord, can you imagine In the temple, he is going off, raging against the priest who said, you can't do that. No, 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 King, you can't do that. You need to leave this space. You you need to leave this this area. This is not for you. He was raging against them in the presence of God. Does he fear the Lord? No. Is he teachable? No. Is he seeking God? He's just going through the, he's going through the, the motions. Says this, leprosy, as soon as he was doing that, leprosy suddenly broke out on his forehead when Azariah the high priest and all the other priests saw the leprosy. They rushed him out. So King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in isolation in a separate house for, for, for he was excluded from the temple of the Lord. His son Jotham was put in charge of the royal palace and he governed the people of the land. When Uzziah died, now this is it. He started and had great success, but this is how he finished his life. When Uzziah died, he was buried with his ancestors. His grave was in a nearby burial field belonging to the kings, for the people said, here's on your gravestone, not that you were a great inventor, not that you were a great leader, not that you sought the Lord, not that this is what he was known for. He had leprosy. And his son Jotham became next king. Can you imagine that? I'm not saying that we don't remember and honor all those great things, but this is what he was remembered for. Oh, he had leprosy. Ladies and gentlemen, I've told you this for weeks now, and I'm serious as I can be. It is crowded at the starting block, not at the finish line. Jesus said it like this, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and, and he who humbles himself will what? He'll be exalted. So this is what this other, another way of saying it, write this down. You either hold on to humility and allow God to lift you up or you pamper pride and God knocks you down. Now, when I say that phrase, God knocks you down, you're like, oh, that sounds like God's out to get me. No, no, God loves you. Why, 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 would, why would God do that? Why would God take you down to a, 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 another lung, rung? Why would God do that? Well, because here, here's the, God doesn't want people running around using his name, taking advantage of people. It's one thing when the people of the world act like the world, but it brings disgrace on the Lord when God's people act that way. And God's not going to lift you up so you can be a brighter, more, more notable, more clear, more, more easily seen person that brings disgrace on the name of God. That's why. That's why he says, no, 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 we need to hide that. We, don't, we need to work on that character a little bit, a little bit more. And I'll leave you with one question today. Just one question. 
Are y'all glad you came to church? <laughs> Here's the question. Are you going to start high and end low? Or are you going to start low and end high? Well, let me tell you a little story. Ben, go ahead and help me if, if you don't mind. I, I want to close it with this thought. Um, Sandra and I, we, uh, we're part of a church planting network. And from time to time, years ago, we did a lot. Now we don't do much at all. We do a different, different vehicle now. But we, we were um, at a church planting, I guess, round table and assessment. We used to help church planters get ready for their day and coach them, show them systems and practices and really encourage them in their faith and be a friend of them and, and say, hey, this is what God, if God can do it in us, God can do it in you, just obey God. And so we befriend them, we coach them, we teach them. And there was this one time, <laughs> this one time I, I, was, I was with a group and they put us in, in groups of people and there was, a, there was a person that, man, he just really, uh, he, he, he just, it didn't land right. He was sharing about his vision. I, hey, I like vision. He was sharing about his talent, and I'm glad you're talented. But the more it went, I'm like, ugh. Man, it just, it didn't sit well. And I thought, uh. So I wanted to make sure that I gave him, a, you know, give him the benefit of the doubt. And I, and I, I got with him, and I said, hey, listen, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you're prideful, but the way that you're presenting yourself may appear to be prideful when you're building your team and getting ready to launch out your church. And he says, I'm not prideful. I'm just really, really confident. <laughs> and I went, oh, no. Because when you do something, anything for God, you realize that I don't have what it takes. I need all of God I can get. It, it, more of this, why did you choose me? But he was super, super, he was, okay, fast forward, fast forward. Guess what? The church grew like gangbusters. I was watching it going, man, that's good. That's, am- wow, that's nah, talent. Wow, he is, he is, he is gifted, that is for sure. But how many know that your gift can take you where your character can't keep you? And what happens is sometimes pride, and listen, that's happened to all of us, myself included. My, it, it mismanaged success. But the problem is, in that church, had a, he had a moral failure, lost his wife, lost everything, his family. Both the buildings, because they were multi-site, went back to the bank. And I just watched it going, man, that breaks my heart. You know why? Because that could be me any day. Not because, aha, I was right. It was more of a, okay, is there any of that in you? And here's the, here's the answer. Yeah, you catch me on the right day, and I can act a fool. Same as you. You get a little bit of an element of success. Well, you know what? I'm pretty good at what I do, and you know what? I did this, and you know what? Hey, uh-uh, no. How about this? A man on his face can never fall from that position. God, if you don't come through today, I'm going to make a mess of this thing. I can't, I can't be a great dad. I can't be a great husband. I need to be a better friend. Lord, I, I don't know how to pastor. I know how to teach the Bible. I don't know how to teach the Bible. I'm dyslexic. I don't know what I'm doing. And so when you live like this, it's such a wonderful thing because all you have is up. All you have is up. You get up and you go, hey, guess what? I'm here to worship you. I'm, I was on my face. Now I'm on my knees. I didn't jump up to my feet, did I? No. God, you're so good to me. I'm so thankful that I got another day on this side of the grass. God, you are so good. You are the giver of life. You help me. You, you, everything good comes from your hand, God. I don't deserve a thing. You've given me everything. Yeah, I've, I've done some work, but really, it was your favor. It was your grace. It was, every, it was your mercy when I missed it. It was your grace when I was going full speed. It's you, God. And I want you to know, it's a fun way to live. Yeah, but I'm ready to run. Trust me, you want to kneel before you run. The, the world will tell you, man, you can make a mark in history. Here's the truth. It's his story, not yours and not mine. So, are we going to start low and end up high? 
Or are we going to start high? And God, because he loves you, will have to take you low. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, this message today, we all, we all receive it. Forgive us when we have a spirit of entitlement, when we have a bad attitude, when we are trying to get all the attention. God, forgive us, forgive us, forgive us, because this is your story, not my story, not our story. We're here for you. You are not here for us. We sing to you. We're not looking for your approval. We live for you. We honor you. We worship you. God, we glorify you. We sacrifice for you. We want to make you famous. Not spend our life trying to make ourselves known. And today, thank you from the life, the, 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 the life of Uzziah that we see it was you that gave success, but success that was mismanaged led to destruction. Lord, we leave this place with a sober heart, clean hands, pure heart. God, let it be for me that I would be humble, we would live for you, we would honor one another, we would consider each other better than ourselves, we just serve one another. We don't have to be the first one in the room, we can hold the door for everyone else to come to meet with you. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, this is a time of, just a time of response. If you're here today, or joining us online, and you would say, you know what, I, 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 need, I needed that today. I, but here's the thing is, I, I've been a God unto myself. What I mean by that, by that is, I'm just not surrendered. I know about God. I may know just some scriptures about Jesus and I'm able to quote, but I am not submitted and surrendered because I'm in pride. And today, I wanna make that shift. I wanna make Jesus, watch, the Lord of my life. Not just a savior, but my Lord. God, please, I surrender. I humbly surrender to you. I submit to the authority of God today. More, maybe you made that decision a while back and you'd say, well, Pastor, I, I, uh, I, I, I meant it when I prayed it. I really did. Pastor, I really did. But I walked away because I had some success. I did pretty good only to find myself mismanaging the wins that God gave me. And today I want to repent and I want to come home. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and watch, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants to cleanse you today. He wants to give you a fresh start. He wants, he wants to empower you, enable you, give you a spirit to empower you to live a life that would honor him and serve one another. If you're here today, you say, I like that, Pastor. I'd like to make Jesus the Lord of my life or I want to rededicate my life to Christ. I want you to slip your hand up on the count of three. I'm going to say a general prayer. I'm not going to call you out, have you stand up. I just want to say a general prayer over the crowd. One, two, three. Anybody in this place? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Very bold of you. All right, look, church, let's do this. Can we, can we pray this out loud and just support the people that said, yeah, that's me. I, I want to surrender today. I want to submit my life to the authority of God. Say this, say, Heavenly Father, I declare you alone are God. Lord, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Save me. I surrender my life to you right now. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he died on a cross and I believe he rose from the dead. Jesus, save me. I'm sorry for living life my way. I surrender to you. Holy Spirit, fill me right now so I can honor God with the way that I live and the way that I love others. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Can we put our hands together for the people that made Jesus the Lord of their life?